Welcome to the Recipe Podcast. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we have a solid crew today. It is, what day is today? June Saturday. 27th. Is that 28th. right? 28th. 9th. 29th. Sorry. Damn, already. June 29th. <laughs> We're halfway through the year, and uh, this is the second Recipe Podcast where I've had an opportunity to take the lead, and hopefully this will be better than last week. Uh, we have some great people here in, in the room uh, that I'm going to get a chance to introduce here. Starting off with the Bobbit, Haley. Hi. Podcast producer. Um, Monica, what's your last name? How come I don't know that? Escobedo. Monica Escobedo, our engineer. Wait, you're the producer. I don't know. P- current time <laughs> producer, and you're a fact checker, too. I looked at la- When I looked at last week, uh, there was a few times where it was like, as a listener, you're like, mm, who's anybody, is anybody going to look that up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but, but he says in the intro, uh, no fact checking. So, And finally, uh, Jay Claudel, video engineer and... You know, basically makes this look good. I think it look. You know what? That stand up from a couple of weeks ago. One of the angles looks super pro, like the one that was like. Just one of them. No, I'm <laughs> saying like I'm talking shot. about like pro pro, because we you watch Netflix. There's a lot of shows nowadays. You're yeah. looking the production value is like. Did they do this with iPhones? Like, <laughs> this looks this looks total crap. Um, and we're missing Eric. We're yeah. missing Chef. Uh, we're missing Chef and we're missing Eric. Um, I don't know what happened with Eric, but it would have been great to have him this this week but we're gonna we're gonna count on you ladies to pick up the rear all right i have to do this uh special announcement and then we have to do like the sponsors right after that too i think that's what like kills the rhythm maybe the sponsors you get it out it's get it over with i get it but but when we do it live i feel like this is it like people are listening right now do you, do you get that feeling it's like okay i'm not listening to that anymore that's how I feel. I was like forward, forward, forward. Maybe Unless you I really just like record it ahead of time and then just <coughs> insert it at before. the end. Yeah, or at, before. Some it people, is at the end. Some no. Some people do it twice though. Yeah. No, but this well, isn't at the end. You have to verbally acknowledge them. Yeah, exactly. So like, have a recording of him already doing it, and then just kind of he didn't like stick it. He likes, to, he likes to say it. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, that's fine. All right, let's do the uh, announcement. Everyone knows that the ACF National Convention is coming up quickly. It will be in Orlando this year, August fourth through the 8th, and regular registration closes on July 7th. Now, if you haven't heard, you might be the only person that hasn't heard, uh, but if you listened last week, you know. The keynote speaker is the author of White Heat and is the one of the only chefs to ever announce, actually, he's the only chef to renounce the three stars awarded by Michelin uh, to his restaurant in London. Yes, the devil will be in the kitchen with the ACF, uh, Chef Marco Pierre White. And that's what you're supposed to be like. Oh, that's exciting. Hey. Yeah, I just picked up his book from the library, White Heat, and I'm learning how to make his oyster tagliatelle. Okay. Yeah, it's it's uh, the key is to warm the oyster shells first, so that when you put the little pieces together, it all sort of stays uh, stays warm. What do you mean, like uh, heat the oyster shell when it's raw? Yeah. So what you do is you you take the oyster apart, then you keep the big part of the shell, and you warm it up. You boil it in water, which disinfects it. Then you put the the oyster, little meat, what the French would call the, the beast, mm-hmm. you put that back in the shell, you pour a little like uh, butter sauce or, or, or broth or something, and then he chops up some, some cucumbers and puts them on top. Yeah. And then, uh, and then oh yeah, the tagliatelle, it's like he, he winds it on a fork and sticks it in there. But I don't think you should put the shell on the plate, right? Shouldn't you be able to eat everything on the plate? No, you, no. You I gotta get back to this. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is, this, is supposed, <laughs> this is supposed to be the shortest intro ever. Marco oh, okay. Pierre White. The ACF invited Chef White to Orlando to talk with our chefs and to, should we call him Chef Pierre White? No, Marco is his first name. Oh, gotcha. To talk with our chefs and to celebrate the 90th anniversary of our organization. While you'll still see some of the best that the ACF offers, the Nationals for all of our cooking competitions, including Chef of the Year and members of the Culinary Team USA, the ACF is also introducing a women's symposium with panels introducing L. Simone Scott and moderated by Stacey Carroll, the Director of Women's Programs for the James Beard Foundation. Celebrity Chef Duff Goldman will be one of our keynotes and promises to be as entertaining for us as he is on the Food Network. As you know, the ACF National Convention is the best place to get your back-of-the-house education, education that moves you to the front of the line in your career. It certainly helped me, in particular my certifications, and you can pick up over the next, uh, you can pick up over 20 hours of CEHs while on site. You know what else you pick up? Your next big career move, networking. I talk about it often, and I know that personal relationships, that one-on-one talk, can lead to the job of your dreams. I'm speaking on behalf of Chef Carol, by the way. I'll be there, and if you register, 
in before July 7th. You can come visit me at our broadcast site. I'll have a signed copy of the recipe for you. Just register at www.acfchefs.org and click on events. Make sure you enter Carol, C-A-R-R-O-L-L, for your bonus book at the convention. In addition, we will select one registrant for a VIP pass. These are officially sold out, so if you want that face-to-face -face experience with Chef Marco Pierre White, register now. Code Carol. Done. Um, yeah, we just got, the rest had of the one sponsors. Effect. Yeah, okay, now, so rest of the sponsors. Anyway, um, it's pretty cool. Oh, damn, this is cool. We're ending it. That's the end of it? <laughs> Well, false alarm. We're going to do uh, some great sponsors now. <laughs> right off the top, Dunkin' Coffee. Why does Dunkin' Coffee always get first? Let's put, that, let's put them last today. We're going to nice start with... A cup of Dunkin' Coffee. Hold on, man. Hold on. <laughs> you can't drink it that fast. It's hot. Oh, put it down. Put it down. We're going to start off with uh, Aceway Incorporated. Aceway, Ricardo Acevedo. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, he cleans big places. Institutions and things, yeah. Uh, but does Chef ever say, like, he says he'll clean everything? And I always feel like yeah. jumping in. I was like, will he clean my car? Like, will he clean anything? If the price is right. Yeah, I right. guess I you're right. Do anything, yeah. yeah, all right then. So Aceway Incorporated, they clean, they clean all kinds of stuff really well. Uh, and in Chef's experience, kitchens. So if you have a kitchen that needs cleaning, uh, call Aceway. Next up, Texas Beef Council. Uh, what's their tagline, please? If you're not eating beef, there's something wrong with you. Yep. If you're not in beef, if you're not eating beef, there's something wrong with you. I don't you. think that's their and tagline. We... It's chef. Oh, yeah. uh, okay, okay. But he also yeah. says another part. Yeah, like Texas is for. I mean, beef is for you, and Texas. We love, is, we love chefs, and no, chefs love, love. They love chefs. That's why so we, we love them. Yeah, something like no, that. That's another. That's another. <laughs> no, said, I think this is it. They love no, chefs. That's why Texas we love them. Beef Texas Beef oh. Council. If beef you is don't, what's if, for dinner. Beef is what's for dinner. Is true. It's Coffee School of Culinary Arts. This. Tell us about Escoffier, Aaron. Auguste Escoffier? Yeah, who is he? Uh, he was a chef that wrote a, a cookbook uh -huh. a couple hundred years ago in French. How and, important uh, is it? It's very important. I mean, he basically invented sauce, right? Yeah, he made the saucier really important in a, in a kitchen. Yeah. Auguste Escoffier, Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Escoffier. If you want, Escoffier. <laughs> <laughs> that's just like. Yeah, that's like that's a sacrilege. A, no, it's an imposter. Maybe. Oh, okay. Escoffier. <laughs> anyway. Um, but school. yeah, you show up, you pay your tuition, they're like, oh, we never said Escoffier. <laughs> yeah. This is the wrong school. Yep. Escoffier, the real one, the real McCoy. School of Culinary Arts, if you want a career in culinary arts, you want to be a culinarian, this is the school to go to. Where is that? Do we have it here in Houston? Uh, I think it's in Austin. All right. It's not, it's not that Colorado? close. Yeah? I think. All right. Oh, is it a culinary school? Like. Yes. Yeah, dude. Oh. Straight up. Like, I think you can do it online now. Uh, okay, that changes everything. Online you can, how could you do on, online I culinary? Know. I've seen like that's called the Food Network. <laughs> that's that seems ridiculous. American Culinary Foundation, ACF. I think we talked about them plenty there. And finally, Dunkin' <laughs> Coffee. This is um, what? Oh, are they going to be oh, separate? The two? Hmm? Dunkin' Coffee. This is your cue. Uh, what no. do you think? Oh yes, just say. A fresh <laughs> cup of coffee from Duncan. This uh, is actually my personal blend that uh, <laughs> Duncan Coffee will make your own personal blend. Uh, he'll oh, grind yeah. up a bunch of coffees. I mean, they got co they have coffee from all from all over. They Don't did they a have tea, tea also. They from do what? tea uh, yeah. Dilma and the tea Dilma, and their teas come from like all over. I think, uh, and we've had mm -hmm. Dun young Duncan. Do we know his name? Mills. No, the young Duncan's not Mills. Mills is the dad, I think. No, it's it's both. They're, he's a junior? Yeah. Oh, that's why Eric said that he's a junior. He, I thought he you just assumed. He's the junior. He's the one who came. I'm not sure his name's Mills. His name's Mills. Yeah, it is. Mills really? Duncan Jr. All right. Mills, if that's not your name, it's not my fault. <laughs> Mills Duncan Jr. He was here for the comedy show. It's pretty good to have them in. Yeah. Um, and that's it. We can now kick off with the show. So let me tell you what I want to talk about specifically about a book. All right. You guys don't know this book. Aaron read this book. Jay... I don't know if you know this book, but it's called A Whole New Mind by Daniel Pink. Did you read it? No. Have you heard about it? No. No. Anyway, you were all given copies last week. No, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. 2005, I think, is when they wrote it. Is when he wrote it. Anyway, I didn't. I didn't. What's that? So that's not old. Yeah, it's not necessarily old. Certainly not for a book. Yeah. So yeah, you you could have read it, but I mean, no, no, no. But it's a book that's like it's time sensitive. What is it about? 
it's time sensitive because he's talking about like a, a whole new mine that'll be important or relevant in the next 20 years. But he wrote it in 2005, so it's 14 years ago. And he talks about specifics and things that we needed to start thinking about. Like what he talks about specifically is about left-minded thinkers, right, right-minded thinkers, right-brain thinkers, and how the right-brain thinkers, you know, who are thinking about their creativity, artistic expression, that side of your brain, uh, have an advantage in the future. But again, now we're in the future. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, don't you agree? Yeah. So certainly, with, and he says the three A's um, that are super to think about. Yeah. Automation, right? Well, that's super topical, relevant now. Asia, also. Uh, and abundance, right? All three things that if you think about them, you can kind of in, make an interpretation as to how that's affected your life directly. It won't take long to draw the connection. Aaron, you're the last one who read it because I haven't read it in 12 years, something like that. I think I read it in 09. So, yeah, about 10 years ago. Oh, 20 I mean, years like ago. Seven, I keep saying 15 years ago. Uh, 2005 is 14 years ago. Got it. Uh, probably seven years ago that I read it. A uh, mentor of mine gave me a copy of the book, wrote a nice little note in the, in the front of it, and that mentor was you. <laughs> lean up. Lean oh, up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about. Tell us about. Tell what us you really timely because I just graduated from college, and um, you know I was thinking about my career and, and the future. And, and of course, when when you're in college, it's like you have so much hope, and the whole your whole future is ahead of you, right? Um, and then as time goes on, that hope sort of like wears away, and then you realize <laughs> that oh man, um, it, you know I, I think they even mentioned in the book when you ask a, a kid who's like in kindergarten, first grade, boys and girls. Um, who here can dance? Who here can sing? Who can draw? They all put their hands up like, oh, I can dance. I can sing. I can draw. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be. And then as you get older, right, your possibilities start to diminish. And then you're like, oh, I can't draw. I can't dance. I can't do this. I can't do that. Um, but when you're young, you're so full of possibilities. And, and I guess in a way, he's trying to encourage people to get back to that mindset of, of being creative because those are the careers that are, that are going to be available. I mean, well, I don't really about? think your like possibilities really go away. I mean, I think there's always the opportunity to grow and to, yeah, to I mean, learn a new trade. So, so what I mean is, if you're like 10 years old, you can dream about being a professional baseball player, basketball player, ballerina, and then like once you're 30, it's like yeah. okay, those those possibilities are gone. Yeah, like, you'll you never all those years to like live up. Or right, go right. Up to that. Yeah, it's right. yeah, it's so competitive now. It's like yeah. you you could be 40 and be like, hey, I want to be a a jazz singer now it's like but, but you're you already starting to look like an old person no no but but, but to, to your point though there are yeah. people who in their in their 40s decided you know what like yeah. there was this there's this one guy who decided i think he was in his 50s and he was like i want to win a, an olympic gold medal and he looked at all the possibilities he's like i can't be a sprinter i can't do this but he, he he learned how to shoot a gun and he won like the the air rifle gold medal oh that's cool yeah, and 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 so so yeah i mean you can there, there certainly are <laughs> But, but anyways, I, I guess in the book, what, what he really hits on is the fact that, you know, what are the trends, right? I mean, right now, Asia is dominating when it comes to engineering and, and mathematics and science um, and, and those types of, like, sort of hard skills, what they would call left brain thinking. Um, right now, we have an abundance of everything. We're so many products that were really expensive, like books. And I mean, there was a time when buying a book was like buying a house mm -hmm. where they had, to, they had to make each page out of a, a sheepskin and – they had to get special type of ink, and and nowadays, I mean, there's so many things that we have access to. So that that's the abundance, and then automation is like um, so many of the things that used to require a human being don't, mm -hmm. right? There's so many things that can be done with computers today that so many jobs are just going obsolete. Even like tactile, like uh, you know, like they have the robots make make the cars essentially. Now you get yeah. rid of people on the assembly line, right? So so in that kind of a world, you know what? especially if you know somebody who's in high school right now and, and, and sort of growing up and, and they're trying to figure out what to do with their lives, um, they might think, oh, let's get, let's get into STEM because that's what schools really focus on now more and more. It's like <laughs> STEM, especially for girls, you want more girls to study science and, and engineering Technology, and math. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and he takes a different perspective, which is, no, we need people who can tell stories. We need people who can, who can draw, who can, who can design things, who can be creative. Mm -hmm. Um, who can express themselves, people with empathy, because that's something that computers can't do, right? They can't empathize with people, understand them. So, right. so um, if he's right, then people with those kinds of skills, which in the past were considered soft skills, you can't really monetize them. Um, but now you see, like with 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 the modern economy, people people making money out of out of all sorts of things, right? Like YouTube videos and 
and uh, teaching and um, things that that sure you can learn with the internet right but there's certain parts of, of teaching of mentoring that that won't go away yeah like he call, he, he calls them high concept high touch mm -hmm. type uh, abilities what do you guys think I mean uh, this is the main thing I told my stepdaughter once in a while I'll come up with something that sticks with her and I know because she'll repeat it to me like years later um, but they're not often and the last one I said to her, I was like, hey, think about what you want to do. Because I said, what do you want to do in school? And she was like, I haven't really thought about that yet. And she goes to art school and plays an instrument. And I was like, well, I wasn't expecting her to say, I want to play this French horn. It's just, a, I mean, I don't think I've ever heard, any, ever heard anybody say something like that unless it was like the piano. So I go back and I ask her again like three, like three minutes later. It's like I have... I have short-term memory loss. I ask again. She's like, I think I, I just, she's like, I just told you. I haven't thought about it. <laughs> and I got to thinking. I was like, well, you know what? If I could tell you if you haven't thought about it, try to pick something that a robot can't take over and do just as well as you do. Or efficiently enough, maybe two robots can do it. But it doesn't matter. It's going gonna, it's gonna to certainly cost less, and it's going to be less risky than hiring on a human being to do it, right? Because yeah. they don't get sick, the whole deal, right? And she got to thinking, maybe at that moment, and then maybe the instrument sounded like something that you – every time I think about it, I'm like, I learned an instrument. I wish it would have stuck with it just to have enough talent with it that if it came down to it, people still want to listen to music. Yeah. I could earn a living playing music in a band or whatever. And, um, and yeah, so from that, I'm doing my part. She's 16. I'm making her think about that stuff. But then – now people are starting to feel insecure even about jobs that you could almost definitively say a robot can't do it and now people are like mm, i don't know maybe because i was thinking about like what i do is like i'm out there i pick wines i taste wines right what about if there's a robot that's able to break down all the components of a wine and be able to quantify it as quality or not quality what do you think about that i don't know i feel like i still wouldn't trust that like i would rather you know human to human interaction if I'm looking for, you know, something that pairs well with whatever I mean, sure. I would want a, I would want a personal opinion. Yeah, because how does the robot enjoy food? Yeah. How, how do they draw how the conclusion for a pair? How would it know that it tastes good together unless somebody said, "Hey, this goes good with this." But what if it has a certain? I mean, the person spice who programmed it, though. You know? Yeah, the person who programmed it would have to. It, the algorithms would be like, and a ridiculous amount. Just think about just the amount of great yeah. varieties in Italy to be able to find the answer to all. It, it never happened. I mean, I shouldn't say never, but it would take a very long time. It would take a lot of... It's a lot of data. A lot yeah. of money. It's a lot of data, a lot of money, and it changes with time. Because let's say next year comes out and all these different places had a bad vintage, and the person punches in, it's 2017 vintage of this wine. The robot needs to be updated, like, constantly. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I feel fairly safe at, yeah. at, in, in that capacity. But there's parts of it that could be broken down. So much so, I got brought in by a, a company. And her name's Amy... Amy Gross, but I can't remember the name of the company, but it's wine something or something along, taste something. And what she did was bring together tasters, and we went up to like, I think it was like northern New York. It was cold as shit in an old like institution, and we did these tests to taste wine. She invited me to go. Mm -hmm. And what it ended up happening is they, we tasted all the same wines. It took forever. And then we had to like, Basically, I can't explain too much of it because she has a copyright on it or I had, I had to sign like an NDA or whatever. I could disclose that I went down there sort of what to do. But let's just say it was the same thing I'm saying, algorithms. And you tasted and you marked things off as you went. And when it was all over, they punched all that information into a computer and they determined, they wrote you back and they said, you could be part of our panel or you can't. So there were people that were just like accurate tasters and obviously you're going to go to wine folks. And it was the weirdest set of people. Like you would think it be, it's all gonna, it's going to be all the Psalms. Or whatever. It wasn't like that. Or it's gonna be it's gonna be all the the winemakers. It was, but there was a mix of winemakers. But everybody in the it, somehow in the wine trade, distributors, sommeliers, and the gr subset that came in was like random. Did you make it? To the I team? made it in. I made it in, oh. uh, which mean which meant I, I can get called again to get, and I'll get paid for it. That means mm -hmm. like I have the right. I can get the, the answers to fall in the same pocket as everybody else did. Mm -hmm. That's the key. Anyway, the software is. And it's being shopped to supermarkets. You're going in, and it's like, boom, boom, boom. I, I just bought an artichoke. I just bought some tomato sauce. I just bought some fettuccine pasta. I just right, punch mm -hmm. it all in. Boom. These are the wines that are in stock right now that you should search out. One at 15 bucks. One at 20 bucks. If you like rosé, here's two prices on rosé too, because it pairs with that as well. 
feel like that would take over, like yeah. people a lot <laughs> of time to like figure out, especially like older people who mm-hmm. aren't as inclined to technology. Yeah. You know. Yeah, they want to hear the conversation. That's what, and that's it what. It would be so much easier and quicker for them, and more convenient, just to be like, "Hey." Certainly, know. and it, and the the important part is like where on this book for me makes the most sense is like if you become a better storyteller, uh, you're better at that job. Period. Because you come, you want to hear about this wine. Okay, I'm interested in having this wine. Christian, you tell me about it. If I have a story where I met that winemaker, I guarantee that's going to be a story that's going to stick in their mind is going to actually make them more excited about their purchase than somebody who just relays some reviews that he read in a book and you know what I mean and said right right because a story is a story is not about facts necessarily right it's about it's about how you felt at a particular time because nowadays every every diner who 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 knows a little bit about wine can can show up and can google and can look at a wine list and say oh I wonder what the 2003 vintage was like and I wonder what this producer is like and by the time you get up, get over to the table as a sommelier, they've done all the research and they know all the facts about it, right? But you come in and you have a you have an interesting story about about going to the winery and it was <laughs> raining that day and and you got your boots all muddy and then you dried off and you opened a bottle of wine and and how um, people told you that 03 vintage wasn't any good, but then when you drank it, it was the best thing you've ever had. Yeah, sure. And and that's what sells the wine, right? Because people want that human connection. I mean, mm-hmm. anybody can Google. And I feel like. Google stuff, right? You know, I hope that that never really goes away with all the technology that's coming out now. You know, like I personally don't want to rely on it so much to where we fall out of touch. You know, mm-hmm. so because I know some people who are like, "Oh, I'd rather say something over text," and it's like, "Well, yeah, there's no human. There's certainly yeah, no. You, you don't see them face to face, and it's like, well, that's weird." But that's what's know? that's what's great about the book is the because I was telling Aaron before we even got on. On uh, on air, I was like, I was reading back notes of somebody who wrote read the book, and and actually wrote down their thoughts as they were reading, chapter for chapter, and I was reading some of the parts. Where I was like, damn, I was like, there are certain things from this book that I've kind of repackaged into my own story. Not saying that I came up with it, but mm-hmm. I read somewhere blank, and then here comes the story. It's completely my interpretation of what was written in the book, but now I realized that some of the way I think my like philosophy towards like life and growth and happiness all comes from what this guy made me think in that book. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of ironic in a way. This guy writes a book that's very logical, um, basically uses the left side of your brain because mm-hmm. it, it, it's analytical to tell you that the right side of your brain, which is your creative side, um, is the part that you're going to be able to, that you really need to focus in on because that's something that is going to be sustainable into the future. Mm-hmm. And now, I can't believe I, I got that math really jacked up. It's 14 years. 2005 <laughs> really isn't that long ago. I kept thinking it's 1995. I was like, how could it have been so long well, ago? Well, what's interesting is uh, those of us who graduated from college, say, like 10 years ago or so, um, that there was a downturn in the economy, right? Sure. So a lot of people, a lot of people my age, were um, were going to get their MBAs, right? They were. They said, you know, there aren't that many jobs out there. There are not that many opportunities. The economy is on the downturn. Let me go get an MBA. That way, you know, I, I'm, I'm sort of hiding out for two years. I come out with, with this piece of paper that's supposed to be valuable. But in the book, he recommends you get an MFA, a Master in Fine Arts, mm-hmm. right, which I thought was really interesting. I mean, because he, he was saying there's so many people with MBAs right now, so many people who have a master's in business administration, and, and uh, companies have, have gotten to the point where they, they're like, we don't need those people anymore. Right? Yeah. We, we need we need somebody who's got a, a creative outlook. And I don't know how true that is, right? I mean, if if there are companies out there who are like, yeah, I want I want an artist to, to come in. Um, but I think it's more people see that as, as a different way of thinking. Like, hey, this guy this guy has a different approach. You know, we, yeah. we you know we have we have people who can do these case studies and and who can think like an MBA. But we want somebody who can think a, a little differently, a little more creatively. And since so many jobs now. Um, require you to are, are really about people skills, right? Yeah. Even being an engineer is about people skills, interacting with other people, not just not just uh, uh, rote memorization and, and numbers. Yeah, and and just the but I, I should say through technology, just the ability to be able to like start your own business um, overnight, just have the idea. People that might have been introverts that really like I can't do it. I really wouldn't know the path. I'm not good at t- talking to people. By default, they become better socially because they, now they get to start a business. Now their yeah. their nerdy side or whatever their their 
you know, their side that respects privacy and they really don't like to put themselves out there says that I could set this up. But then you set it up and like you still need to have the human interaction part. Mm -hmm. So they get better at it. So it's helping people practice. But then you see the reverse with younger people where we give them less opportunities. I mean, like I feel like right people now. People from 3i. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, like it's crazy. Like people who who have, uh, you know, that, that way of thinking, they're almost like robots. They, they don't even yeah. know how to respond to you even when you ask them to do something. And I think more and more. Like, let, let's use you as an example. Within your unit of five people who work in the bakery, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can easily say the finishing touches on those desserts could be done by a robot. That could be one person on your team. I mean, I know I'm breaking it down to very simple. Yeah. But let's say this person's great at plating. You know who's really good at plating? A robot who could put it exactly in the same spot and put the decoration exactly in the same spot. It's pretty precise. Mm -hmm. So how does everybody in there protect themselves from not being the one that loses the job because it probably wouldn't be just one person who does that but you now potentially need one less person in well, the bakery i mean like i think all new technology and like i always wait to update my phone after like two or three updates come out so i know that all the bugs are gone and my phone's like i'm gonna spaz out um but i feel like that would be <laughs> a part of it you know like things that you would have to fix um and like you mean on the machine yeah yeah and like how much space would it take up because you know <laughs> how cool would it be if it like shop did you so see like tight, the microsoft you know? like new robot thing it's like no. pretty small actually really yeah really yeah and then they have like these new like little goggles where a lot of um doctors and stuff they're trying it in actual hospitals where like the computer is like out there so like you're inside the computer kind of and you're just like doing things with your hand and you're actually doing it on something or someone really it's so weird yeah so they're gonna have this little robot operate on someone, that kind of thing? No, the oh the robots for something else, but like the goggles oh. are like for like practicing and stuff. Oh damn. Yeah. Well then that would be cool, like let's say there was a surgeon who was somewhere in Japan, let's say, or India. It's like this guy knows how to do this. No, they've already done that like ten years ago. But they, for, they had a, remotely? They had a Russian surgeon, I think, do a surgery um yeah, it was like a while ago. They like do a, a lot Russian of stuff surgery, like that. do a do a remote because because he was the one guy who knew how to do this oh, particular so that, particular. I thought you thing. had to be in the room, like you know, like actually with, you know, like <laughs> you're moving it, and then the you know that's the, scary. I mean, I guess yeah. then you would say. I feel like I wouldn't trust. But then that. I guess you would say then just have the guy do it. But what yeah. I was trying to say is like that's how they you know we've run trials on people who are like I'll sign off, I'll let this robot do it. They probably do it for free, I would guess. But if people are paying for it, it means they probably perfected some of it. Yeah, I think so, and and it's similar with uh, you know in war you have the the drone pilots. I remember they were talking yeah, about sure. they were talking about should drone pilots be able to get like medals of honor and stuff like that. <laughs> no, I'm serious. So, somebody somebody suggested that they they're like no this this guy this guy showed valor in the battlefield. And he's like he's sitting in Seattle on a computer, right? And, and he's like and they're like don't diminish his contribution. I'm like hey, okay. It's okay. true. So you give it to the operator. You give it to the operator. Yeah, the guy yeah. the guy who hit you know enter. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and, no, and, and it's like, and, and I mean, if he didn't works, press it, it, then yeah, if he didn't press the button, um, no. But what I meant, you were you were saying, uh, yeah, is, I thought you were talking about like the actual like right. the robot thing. No, no, no right, no, no. Like you have the drone, and you put like you know, so it looks like there's a person in yeah. there. Yeah, it's like then you you know you take out this robot stand, and it's like, and you put a medal on him. You get what I'm saying, right? So, so the actual machine, yeah, yeah. yeah but let's say they, That's they what make we it, they're making this saying. drone pilot, and they make it look real, so they make. You know, they make like a figure that oh, sits you know inside I mean? of it. Yeah. But it's not real. It's not doing it because the, the thing is being operated remotely and the whole thing moves some other way. He's right. not doing anything. Right. But then you take that guy out of the drone plane and you're like, hey, here's your medal, here's your medal of honor. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Which is even funnier. I, I, guess, I guess that would be funnier than, than <laughs> a guy who's like, I don't like, think not really. care, but. <laughs> huh? No, I'm just, uh, I get it. So, yeah, I don't think. You should put a medal on on that. It's like you showed valor, but you were you know standing behind a computer. If it if it fails, there's no even there's not even any hard feelings. Yeah, it's just like I, I guess it's like a video I mean, it's game. A, you just restart. It's, like, it's a oh, really it's a really know. expensive piece of mach machinery. I think maybe that's what pissed people off more than anything. Uh, like when Trump was talking about this drone, he repeated twice. He's like, and and you know there was no one in it. It's like yeah, that's why it's called a drone. <laughs> that's why it's called a drone plane because it's not a plane. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's a drone, not a plane. Yeah, but 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 you know the the guy the guy a thousand miles away operating it probably had his feelings hurt when the thing got stolen or shot. Oh, down. Oh, got shot down. Yeah. yeah. So well, he, then that's that guy's beef. You know what I mean? Like have him go figure out who did it. 
we just we lost money, you know, and it's like it's a disrespect. I get it. I don't want to get into that. All right. Back to the book. <laughs> hey, back. No, I really don't. Get, he said, create artistic, create artistic things, uh, create emotional beauty. And again, like, I, I shit you not, like last week there was this older couple that was coming in there. Their kids said, it's your anniversary. Can they make something great for them in the, in the, bak- in the bakery? Uh, were you in there for it? When? When they made the dessert for, for those folks last week in the restaurant? Maybe. You might have been. Anyway, uh, your colleague finished it. And the people... Mm-hmm. Their excitement from looking at this dessert, it's like I've never gotten that excited about dessert. Mm-hmm. But let's just say it's something special. Your name is on it. Happy anniversary. And they took photos of them. It looked like they had just won the lottery. They <laughs> So much so they called out your colleague and like gave, him hu- gave her hugs. Oh, okay, and stuff so like. I, I wasn't there. Oh, okay. So it, was it Saturday? Yeah, and it was late. Yeah, I don't work Saturday. Oh, okay, there you go. And, um, and I just thought about it. I was like, that was something creative. That was something that affected the people so much so. They took pictures of it, and they're going to really remember that moment. Mm-hmm. It's like, I've seen food that interests me, and you know, it makes me, I want to eat this food. It makes everything go off in your brain, like all the bells and whistles. But I've never been that excited about the design of something. And that, again, is in this book. And I've realized that more and more, uh, I'm more I gravitate more towards you know, the senseless emails you get every day, but they're all about design. It pleases me to look at a building somewhere in the Alps that somebody built that was built into the contours of the mountain and one of the walls is the mountain. That's cool to me. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I look at those, and those pictures, you know, excite me because I think like, I can't believe technology allows this kind of construction to happen. And maybe someone had the idea before and the idea that now they can execute it. This is good. This is like a synergy where both parts are working well mm-hmm. together. Here's, you know, technology, here's creativity. Uh, and one of the questions I found myself asking, which I asked you guys, is like, I think about it all the time, is when I have people and I hire them, what's their level of uh, competencies? I'll say, tell me within your the job you're going to do, what's the difference between something that's creative and something that's innovative? And apply it to whatever your job is. And not every job is, it, it's not easy to do for every old job. I mean, if you ask somebody who's just coming to be a, well, a bartender is pretty creative, but somebody's just coming in to do the same job, like let's say the person who's in charge of putting the cherry on each dessert or whatever. To have them say this, like they can say, I don't know if I u- utilize either because I'm just really just putting stuff on top, creativity or innovation, but you need to find the answer within it. And that's like a question that to me comes directly from this book. I want to know how that person's thinking, how they're separating those two, and if they have competency in both. I mean, what do you guys think about that? Like, if you had to answer, what's your, what's your answer, Monica? I don't know. I mean, in re- maybe not even regards in regards to what you're going to specifically do because you haven't quite decided yet, and I'm, I'm not even sure if you've quite decided yet. But let's say you have made that decision, you're going to make mm-hmm. a move in that direction. How would you how would you separate the two? Like what each mean, or just in general for a job? How how it affects your, you know, the the, the job and the task that you're going to do. I mean, creativity, I think, is just, like, expressing yourself and, like, kind of just doing your own thing and then, like, being innovative and stuff. Like, you're doing something to change something. Yeah, sort of an influence. I'd say that. I I can agree with that. Haley, how about you? I don't know. I mean, like, pertaining to me and my career, um, I I definitely have my plans laid out that I'm not ready to talk about. Yeah. But, um, because, I mean, I haven't really thought it all through. Right. So, I mean, I guess TVA at the moment. Yeah, and, and, that's, but, fi- and that's fine. But would you say that you, you were competent at both? Like you, you have enough creativity and you have, and you have enough ideas of how I mean, to innovate? I feel, like there's always, I feel like you should always push to, you know, get more creativity and to try and – like I feel like whenever, like whenever Darren's around, I get super tense and nervous, and mm-hmm. I feel like that kind of caps my creativity. I feel like whenever I'm more relaxed and I'm just – you Does know. he stifle your creativity? No. <laughs> I mean, but whenever he's looking at you, it's like, I'm not thinking about it. Mm. I'm, like, worried about making sure oh it's God, perfect. Oh, yeah. God, what am I doing? I have to, you know, over... I feel like I overthink it. Yeah. But How about, how about you? Aaron, Aaron's a French teacher full-time, but you're off now, Summer. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I, I always feel like I need to be engaged and creative, and that's why, that's why I chose to teach French, right? 
Um, it's not one of the, the standardized tested subjects where you have specific things to check off and you have to get the students to fill in the right bubbles and all this kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a subject where you have a lot of freedom, right? Yeah. They give you a lot of latitude where you can hopefully, um, if, if uh, I'm doing my job correctly, I can, I can allow students to find things that they're interested in. Um, like, for example, I have students who are really interested in, in French film. Okay. And so I found some some French films that that were that were appropriate, or I trimmed some some parts of it right to where I could show <laughs> the class, and and show them just how how different the French attitude towards cinema cinema is to to Americans, right? And what is the attitude? How would you how would you summarize that? Well, I mean, I think no, I, well, I think I think when when um, I mean, French people sometimes they can be blunt, right? They can sure. come across yeah. as Direct. rude, but they'll say they'll say stuff like, "Oh, I watch American movies when I don't want to think." You know, when I can watch like, you know, you watch Transformers or whatever, and there's things, bombs going off or whatever. Sure. And at the end, and, and at the end, you ask somebody, okay, so tell me about the Transformers movie you just watched. Like, what was the plot? They're like, they don't know. Like, well, what, what happened, right? But, but the French films oftentimes are, um, I mean, they're more artsy, right? Yeah. They're less, they're less about, they're less about telling a, a linear story. And they're more about the the, the craft, like how does it make all, you feel? <laughs> yeah. Right? How, how does it make you feel? Um, what kinds of questions do you have afterwards? What kinds of philosophical ideas does it pose? The overall um, lesson and stuff. Right, like all sorts of things. And a film involves a bunch of different artists, right? It's not just one craft, right? There's a there's a videography, and then there's the costume design, and then there's the cinematographer, the acting, right? sure, the cinematographer. sure. All these different things working together. And and if you get some practice, you, you you actually start to see like wow, I recognize the style of this particular um, director and how how it shows in in each film. Um, and then of course, I mean, if it, if it's a in a different language, part of it is the language itself. Like, would you how would they have expressed this idea in English? Um, because when you when you express something in a different language, sometimes it comes across differently. It's not just this word equals this word, sure, and it translates word for word. So. If you're familiar with another language and you're watching a, a show and you're watching the subtitles, sometimes you'll pause it, right? Like, um, for example, there are in, in French and I, I guess in Spanish too and other languages, um, adjectives, by, by listening to an adjective, you can tell if the person's masculine or, or feminine, right? Um, I, I guess in, in, or even like nouns itself, right? The word friend in Spanish. Yeah. Um, when someone says the word friend, you can tell whether they're talking about a boy or a girl. Sure. But you can't tell that in English, right? Yeah. And so we're watching we're watching the films and and um and seeing that come across, you know, like a woman writes a note because a lot of these are romantic films, right? A woman writes a note and how does an English translator translate the the fact that okay, right into a this, girlfriend. <laughs> right. In this note, you you understand that there's a girl who's writing this, but she's not actually saying that, right? But you can tell by the by the adjectives that she's using, or the way that there's a formal way of saying you and an informal way of saying you. Yeah, and, correct. And how how that register can change, um, and can it can mean a lot. It can make a big difference. It means in a, a conversation, ton. right? And and you might notice, like, wait a second, you were using the formal way of talking to me before, and now you're informal. And how how do you translate that? It's not it's not easy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there's all these all these different questions, and and you can watch the movies over and over again, and and um, Maybe it's not just French films. Maybe you guys have American films as well that you know of that that you can watch multiple times, and each time it gets better and better, right? Um, and those are the ones that – They're just few and far between now. Yeah. I mean I, we've gone through the whole summer. That I haven't thought once to myself I really want to go watch that movie. I mean if there's one if there's one thing like off of what he said that I wish that we could do, technology could do, is that we just find the place in our brain that allows us to learn a language and let us just like plug that in. And learn them all at once. I know, mm -hmm. obviously, it requires work to learn something, but just give us that because I think that would solve a lot of problems. Because yeah. the, what he's saying is the nuance in language. I mean, I mean, the way I see it, there's a lot of times I know I miss things whether somebody translated or not. I used to get frustrated beyond belief at the the guy who was the translator for boxing for like years. I don't remember his name because I hated him so much because <laughs> he they would go ask him and this guy just put his life on the line boxing. And then he would say this long thing, and then this guy pretended like he knew Spanish. He said something emotional, deep, something almost in a way you could only say in Spanish. And you were hoping for this guy to come through with the translation, and it was like just a dud. And anybody who really understood Spanish was like, damn. Anybody who doesn't understand Spanish at all right now f got cheated 
in the yeah. here, you know, from hearing what this guy had to say, because he almost just died in there. I mean, that, that's how intense it is. And if we all just knew it, I think there'd be so much less misunderstandings. Because think about other countries, like lead, world leaders. World leaders know five, six languages. A lot of them do. And most of our presidents, I'm not even singling anybody out, they go, and they don't even, they're not even close to understanding the language or the nuance. Maybe they get briefed. Who knows? But stop and think about how many of these world leaders, when they meet Americans, they're like, mm, I'm not even sure what I want to say to this guy. Yeah, sure. Even if they do speak English, I mean, uh, for yeah. many of them. They, no, because you saw Trump. It's like you would think somebody would take him aside and then he'd say, hey, you know what? Next, when you meet these folks, they're going to double kiss you. Or this one, you're not going to stick your hand out and shake their hand, and these people are going to bow. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but he's already flubbed that so many times. It makes us, I mean, I, just on a, on a very visceral level, you're looking at it like, this guy is making a lot of mistakes out there. Well, but he's, he's traveled a lot too, right, as a, as a businessman. I mean, it's I would like, assume so. I mean, he, he'd been to Japan a bunch of times and, and China. So how do you there. miss all that? Like, what did he miss? All right, I don't want to talk about well, Trump. Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> we, always, we always end up in Trump, truly. Yeah. Okay. All right, sorry. Anyway, back to the book. I recommend the book. I what recommend a, a Whole New Mind. This wasn't meant to be a an ad for the book but I would say it's worth reading now even as much as it was 14 years ago and I think it's especially good for people who who um, you know younger people who who uh, find themselves more creative right they have a creative side to them they're good at telling stories they, they're good at making that human collect connection right but maybe they're C students or maybe, you know maybe they were never that great at math and science and and sometimes they feel down on themselves for that like you know if I'm not good at math I can't do anything with my life um, but if, if this guy's right and if his predictions are right, yeah. in the future, more and more jobs will, will require somebody who has that empathy, who has the ability to tell a story, to make a human connection. Um, because the mathematical side of things, the scientific side of things will be, will be handled either overseas um, by people who are smarter and can do it for cheaper, mm -hmm. um, by computers. Um, and so we'll see. I mean, we'll, we'll see. Maybe, maybe 10 years from now when we, when we do like – the reunion, the, the reunion podcast, right? We'll, we'll look back and we'll say, "Yeah, we were right." You know, um, creative people are ruling the world. Yeah, I mean, maybe we'll there are some already. I mean, I would certainly say that th there's an argument for that already. But pick up the book, Daniel Pink, uh, Daniel Pink, a uh, whole new mind. And uh, next week we'll have Chef back. I don't know if we're doing next week, and we'll see what the format is. But this was a, definitely a more a more thinking men's uh, comedy show. <laughs> um, you're special. You're great. Make an impact on someone today. Thanks, guys.